Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the virtual stage for the ICLG.com webinar on international shipping and cybersecurity. It's my pleasure as publisher of the International Comparative Legal Guide series to introduce this webinar today, adding to our global coverage and dialogue with three leading experts in the maritime industry and contributors to our ICLG Shipping Laws 2020 and 2021 publications. It's arguable that cybersecurity is the biggest challenge faced within the maritime industry. As of this year, we've seen the IMO step up their guidance for protecting vessels, which many see as a milestone for maritime safety and security. Our three panelists today are going to be discussing topics within this complex space, including cyber risks, incident response, and the future of the industry across three different continents. Before I introduce our chair and moderator for the next hour, I would like to highlight to you that we do have a chat function that you can use at any time for questions or comments that our panel will pick up on. Um, and we've also designed a couple of polls for you to answer during the webinar to get your feedback on the discussion. You'll be able to see both of these features on the right hand side of your screen. So I'd like to hand over to our chair, Julian Clark. Julian is global senior partner at the law firm INTS and is also our contributing editor for the ICLG shipping publication. Julian's passions for emerging technologies within the industry has seen him become a thought leader in this space and take up positions such as chair of the cybercrime and shipping subcommittee for the CMI and also chair of the Maritime London Innovation and Technical Committee, among many other professional associations and accolades. I'll hand over to Julian now to guide you through the next hour with his superb panel, which I'm sure will provide a stimulating discussion. Thank you and over to you, Julian. James, thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon, uh, good, good evening, everybody, wherever you may be in the world. It's a pleasure to be with you today on this first of these series of ICLG uh, webinars. Uh, I hope that we have an exciting debate today and we do want to make this as interactive as possible. So as James said, we will be running some polls as we go through uh, today. I will raise those poll questions at key points through the discussion. And then of course, please do join into the chat function. So throw in, throw in your comments and your questions and we, the panel, will try to deal with those uh, as we can as we go through this hour. So let me uh, introduce you uh, with great pleasure to my two other panel members today. Uh, Bruce Paulson, um, who is on your screen. I can't say he's left, right, or up, or below, because it might be different uh, to you. Uh, but Bruce, who is smiling at you now and is the only person on the screen wearing, uh, wearing glasses, uh, is a partner with Sue and Kissel. Uh, in New York, uh, he's been the chair. He's the chair of Sweden Kissel's Sanctions Practice Group, and he's been a partner there since 2002. Um, he was named as one of the global top 10 maritime lawyers uh, by Lloyd's List in December 2020, uh, and uh, he's listed in Chambers USA 2020. Who say of him, he's a highly regarded maritime practitioner with first-rate advocacy skills. That's better than mine, uh, clearly. Um, and also, uh, that's just uh, one of the few accolades about Bruce. He's also listed in Legal 500 Super Lawyers. And one that I particularly like is the fact that Avocom uh, listed him and credited him as being superb uh, with a score of 9.5 out of 10. Uh, Bruce, clearly you must try harder, because uh, where is that missing point five? <laughs> Bruce, Bruce specialises in handling complex commercial maritime disputes, handles finance, securities-related disputes in the shipping industry. Uh, we've had the pleasure of co-presenting together at Tulane. Uh, he also has substantive experience in the area of international trade sanctions and been deeply involved in handling piracy issues before US government agencies and is an expert in the recognition and enforcement of arbitration awards. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's Bruce. And you might say, how on earth do I follow that? Uh, well, I can today, uh, because also on your screen is another one of the world's uh, uh, most recognized maritime practitioners, legal practitioners, that's Adia Fun. Uh, Adia is a partner with Bloomfield LP, 
uh, and he's advised extensively on oh it's a massive lift of things here structuring implementation resolution of complex transactions and disputes cross-border matters and his experience cuts across uh, financial institutions shipping <coughs> uh, oil and gas aviation logistics capital markets consumer fintech and uh, real estate and he too has been recognized by all the leading legal directories in the world uh, who's who legal 2020 saying of him that he's highly recommended by sources for his impressive practice that covers shipping finance and maritime claims and then legal 500 also saying of him that he is particularly adept at helping to navigate the complexities of the nigerian maritime legal framework demonstrating flexibility in light of changing requirements Addy and Bruce, absolute pleasure to be with two of the two of you again today. Um, so what we're going to do uh, in this format is uh, the three of us have, have got some questions that we're going to throw between us. As I say, uh, we hope that you will join me on the chat function. Uh, and if I kick off with this first question, and we're going to try a little bit of tech here as well and see if I can share my screen. So bear with us because it's a new platform for us. Um, the first question we're looking at is, some still view cyber risk as project fear uh, and we wanted to get the views of uh, all of us as to whether or not we think that's accurate uh, how our jurisdictions are looking at cyber from both a legal regulatory and governmental perspective uh, if i start very briefly from my own perspective i've witnessed the project fear allegation i was lecturing a few years ago in germany uh, on cyber risk and when we took questions from the law, uh, a, a German ship owner put his hand up, was patted the microphone and said that I was just uh, giving false propaganda, that cyber was not a risk at all, and it was just lawyers trying to drum up additional work. Um, I strongly disagreed with him then, and I disagree with him now. Uh, and if I can uh, share my screen, which I'm going to attempt to do, let me have a look and tell you some of the reasons why I, I say that. Um, and that is, uh, just bear with me, let's look at some of the uh, facts around cyber security. So over the last 12 months, we've seen a 400% increase on attacks in the maritime sector. Over the last three years, we've seen a 900% increase on attacks in operational technology, which of course for shipping is a huge uh, area. And then if you look at a report that was compiled by Lloyd's List, which was looking at a worst case scenario of an attack where 15 Asian ports were targeted, the total amount of that cyber intrusion was <coughs> at 110 billion US dollars. When you combine that with some other statistics, 92% of the estimated costs arising from cyber attacks were insured. US government over the last decade has expended 130 billion in relation to cyber risk and is planning was planning in 2020 to spend a further 17 billion and we've all seen the statistics of what kind of attacks we're seeing in our sector from the attacks on the antwerp port that went undetected for three years moving contraband uh, drugs arms uh, and other illegal traffic um, and then, of course, 2017, we saw Maersk caught up in the geopolitical attack that was not Petia, uh, with a recorded $300 million uh, loss. Costco and the U.S. port of San Diego in 2018. Norsk Hydro and the U.S. Coast Guard in 2019. And then uh, CMA, CGM and the IMO itself uh, last year. Uh, and so I think what this is saying to me is that it is not uh, Project Fear. But let me hand over to uh, my two co-panelists. Addy, what, what would you say? Hi, good afternoon, and thanks very much, Julian. Um, I will kick off by saying uh, it is an honor to be on the panel with yourself and Bruce. Um, you guys have a stellar reputation in the market, and so it's a privilege, and thank you to ICLG for inviting me. Um, I think it's still much Project Fear in Nigeria, I'm speaking more from a Nigerian perspective, and I would say that is based on lack of understanding as to what the potential uh, impacts of cyber attacks will be. Um, bringing it home, you're looking at more important things 
for the government. I'm not saying cyber attacks are not important, but the focus has been on a general perspective to be on the IT aspects of cyber security, which has to do with data security, which is appreciated. Uh, and that is where by we're still gathering data. The, uh, the government agency has put a place a policy for data security for you to have. But bringing it down to the maritime sector, we're still trying to understand this area and how important it is. I just understood as that, um, that the maritime regulator, which is NIMASA, is just about to issue a marine notice to the industry in relation to the IMO regulation resolution and the fact that it's part of their uh, laws now and the need for us to have a cyber security management plan in the SMS. So that tells you we're in March now and we're just looking to notify the industry we're still behind. I think it's still, they haven't embraced it and we need to continue to have these conversations to ensure that everybody embraces it. I boldly say that we probably have the same status for the west coast of Africa, Africa down the Gulf of Guinea. Everybody's still, it's still fear. More importantly from, like you rightly mentioned, like the German ship owner, they probably see that there's an added cost and not necessarily any risk. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, Bruce? Sure, and apropos of, of, of your comments, um, uh, Julian, uh, I had a recent telephone conversation with a very sophisticated ship owner about sanctions risk. Um, and, and I got a, uh, a, a tirade in response uh, <clears throat> about not only lawyers, but accountants sitting behind their desks and telling him, a man who puts ships and men to sea, what risk is. Um, to an extent, he had a point. Um, this is a risky business. And, and over the years, we have seen in this fragmented industry from family companies to the largest publicly held shipping operations, um, you know, sort of layers of additional compliance risk over the years from, uh, you know, IMO 2020, ISM in 1997, environmental risks, sanctions, you name it. And here comes another compliance cost, another headache, uh, another uh, series of hires that need to be made for shipping companies and that particularly burdensome on smaller ones. So I, I think you see different attitudes at different levels in the business. Um, I'm not so sure it's project fear anymore, although that was there a few years ago perhaps, but there are still people for whom it is project head in the sand. Um, but those with head in the sand thinking, I understand risks. Um, I don't need to bother too much with this one. Just do a few things, tick the boxes. Um, but but the risk really is there. Uh, and in an industry with with uh, thin profit margins, um, it, it does come at a cost. Um, so I can understand the reluctance, but uh, the fact is that it, it, we, uh, people in the industry can't be reluctant any longer. You mentioned the $17 billion that the U.S. government was going to spend this coming year. There was, in the waning days of the Trump administration, the White House issued a, an extensive uh, and uh, uh, long-in-the-works report on cybersecurity in the maritime business, and which was going to involve uh, an interagency approach to resolving issues, and it's a very complex document. Shortly after the inauguration, that document was taken down off the White House uh, website. Um, you can still search and find it and read it if you'd like. Uh, but I think, you know, perhaps there's a rethink going on in the White House. Um, but the fact is, you know, this, this, this does need to be uh, project embrace. Um, if you look at the risk factors, uh, for instance, uh, in the offering memorandum or the annual report of a, a U.S. listed publicly held shipping company, uh, you're going to see risk factors about sanctions. You're going to see risk factors about uh, uh, in, in environmental risk. And now you're starting to see risk factors about cyber risk. And um, the fact is, it is a risk. It seems like piling on. But what do you do? And do you bother insuring against it? Which is a big question. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, there are a number of issues that, you know, uh, um, that arise. Uh, I know that uh, uh, the, the uh, program description for today talks a little bit about intellectual, uh, I mean, uh, information technology and operational technology, IT and OT. Um, you know, 
there are, and maybe we can put up the slides. <clears throat> sure. Um, the one that says enterprise risk, which is the fifth page in the deck. <clears throat> which focuses primarily on um, IT risks, enterprise level risks, which are, you know, in some ways, business agnostic. This would be the same if you ran an auto parts business as, as uh, a shipping business. Uh, there's risk of damage and destruction of data. Um, there's risk of stolen money, lost productivity, uh, theft of IP, embezzlement, fraud, disruption to business, business interruption, as well as um, reputational harm. And, you know, and you add to that, that, uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, after a cyber attack, you may not get all your data back. And if we could go to the next slide, which goes to the particular vulnerabilities that were list by IMO, listed by IMO and its guidelines about vulnerable systems aboard ship. SHIP has a whole host of OT issues um, that um, you know, create a greater risk in some ways than the average operating company. Um, I mean, just take the first one, you can leave the rest off the list, bridge systems. Um, there, there are, of course, you know, CFAIR and, and, and staff and C-suite training um, videos and other e-learning uh, platforms that you know you and I at uh, law firms and uh, other businesses all have to look at to avoid phishing and so forth. And seafarers get trained with videos on what to do, what not to do with respect to cyber crime and cyber risk. Uh, in one of those training videos that I watched in preparation for this uh, presentation, um, there was an incident which they said was a true story. The names were changed to protect the innocent, uh, where a, a bridge officer. Um, unwittingly had malware installed in his phone, came aboard for a voyage, plugged his phone into the uh, computer on the bridge, uh, crashed the whole system when the malware got into the uh, chip on the system. The ship was still at the dock happily, uh, and no navigational or other problem occurred, but it was an enormous um, issue for, for the vessel owner. Um, Imagine if that had happened while the ship was going through the channel on its way out to sea, uh, and what kind of damage could result um, from that simple an error. So, with the occupational or the uh, operational uh, technology issues that shipping has, you hear bridge system, cargo handling, propulsion, access control, passengers, uh, crew welfare, communications, you name it, a major casualty could be the result of a cyber crime against the shipping company. And uh, Project Fear um, is, is just not going to do. Um, in addition, just a brief um, reference, we now have the BIMCO clause, which is beginning to come into use in a number of different maritime contracts that um, uh, requires both parties to have uh, cybersecurity measures in place uh, to be able to verify that they're there and document that um, to use uh, reasonable endeavors, as we would say, best efforts to uh, um, to have third-party vendors also in compliance and with a liability cap that could be at a modest level if you leave the gap, uh, the blank uh, open, um, that would be a $100,000 liability cap unless there's gross negligence or willful uh, uh, um, neglect. And so in this case, um, with all that's out there about cybercrime and its consequences, um, if you have your head in the sand or if you're engaging in Project Fear, you have a risk of being found uh, liable above and beyond any cap because that possibly could be gross negligence. Thanks. 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 I, I want to come back to Addy briefly in a moment just to see his views on this debate that you've, you've raised about IT and OT. I mean, one of the things that we've been saying, um, as I know the two of you are aware, and some people out there listening might be aware, we launched a new initiative on the 1st of February, uh, which was addressed at uh, the risk of OT uh, attack in the maritime field. Uh, and what we've been saying is this description of the cyber house, that what we've done in our, if you think of our industry as a house, uh, what we've done is we've protected that house against attack with 
uh, you know, locks on the doors, locks on the windows, pressure pads, security lights, alarm systems. And that's what we've done to protect our IT. We've, we've done a lot to protect our IT. But at the side of our house is a garage. And on that garage, we haven't got the locks. We've got a normal garage door lock, and we haven't put an alarm system on it. And that's the OT. And what we're finding is the cyber criminals, the hacktivists, are breaking into the garage, they're going into the OT, and through the OT, breaking into the IT systems and also then taking over the operational technology. And for me, you know, when I'm talking about this, people say, yeah, but point, point, Julian, identify a ship that's been, you know, sunk or spun around the circles or taken massively off course. Well, we do know of interference with GPS and navigational systems, but actually the thing that's rang the most, the biggest alarm bell for me was on the 5th of February when the Florida water treatment plant was hit. That was OT technology. It's the same kind of technology that we see on ships. And that, that hacker changed and adjusted a sodium hydroxide of 100 parts per million into the water treatment and moved that up to 11,100 parts per million. Uh, and uh, Steve Carden commented on this and said, while the method of intrusion in the Florida attack was an abuse of remote access credentials shared between employees, there are many other approaches that hackers can and will take to infiltrate critical infrastructure facilities. With the increased interconnectedness provided by the internet, there are no longer many facilities that can write the line isolation or air gap for security. While state actors may be less focused on infiltrating the electric power grid, they may find easier to attack seemingly less critical and less protected municipal facilities. Now, I can take that quote written about the Florida treatment plant attack and apply that to shipping and say, this is why we will be targeted. Addy, what's your view? You're on mute, Addy, I think. Yeah, thanks very much, Julian. I do share your sentiments gravely, and I'll take us back to the explosion that happened in Lebanon, I think it was last year, and the effect it had. This was a ship that was within port's limits, and the way it affected the whole of Lebanon. Now, in Nigeria, we have an area called the Papa, which is like the main up, um, port, where you have a lot of tank farms. Now, so you can imagine... Taking the example of another incident that happened in February 2017. So it's quite interesting the Florida one happened in February too. So it seems a lot of things cyber related happened in February. And the cyber criminals took control of a navigation system of a German owned container vessel that was en route from Cyprus to Djibouti for 10 hours. Now, the master reported an inability to maneuver that vessel, said the IT system of the vessel was completely hacked. So the vessel was under control of cyber criminals for 10 hours. I could imagine someone hijacking a vessel laden with petroleum products meant to come to a port, uh, what we call it, not a tank farm here, it does ram into that. The multiple effects will be crazy. Sorry to use that word, because there's residential pre pre estates behind that. So the question is, as I said earlier on, we don't appreciate the importance of this. We all know that shipping is still the largest way to move cargo around the world. It's integrated into us. The importance of shipping was brought to the fore again during COVID because it was instrumental in moving things around the world. So we cannot afford to let this extra cost, which has a potential, and something I have a passion about called maritime terrorism. There have been instead, very few reports about it as to how vessels and maritime um, installations can be used as terrorist acts. So we need to also look at this aspect. We see cyber criminals currently just asking for ransom. Once it gets one notch up and see the benefit of IT using to cause harm, I think we probably have more problems. And that's why IT is not just the way, and we just need to look at the OT as well. Thanks, Addy. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. We're looking at the chat now, and there's some very interesting comments coming across, which are totally supporting what you've just said, Addy. Uh, are you... IUG Adi Janju has said not only is this an important matter, uh, but that he sees Project Fear across the entire African coast and agrees with you, Bruce. It's interesting. I wrote this down when you said it as well. Project Embrace. Uh, watch that to be hashtagged now across the world. That That is a great message, Bruce. Um, and William Chetwood saying... Isn't the, isn't the thing the industry should be frightened about is the scale of the incident that a cyber attack could result in, combined with the widespread insurance exclusions 
uh, for such an attack. And again, there's people on the chat saying, let's not forget about the instance of GPS hacking uh, that we've seen. Uh, Charles uh, Boulay uh, saying, few ship navigators, navigators now know how to use maps, compasses, and sextants, totally reliant on GPS. Uh, now, before we go to our next question, if I direct people to the polls, we want to do our, our first poll. Uh, if you go to the option which says polls on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see there's a question. Has your organization experienced a cyber incident of some kind? And we've given through three options, never once or more than one occasion. If I could ask people to vote on that now, we can see what we're, we're coming in. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep you updated as to the results at the moment. Never is winning on the, oh, oh no, I'm going to be like a horse racing commenter now. Never at once, they're now neck and neck uh, with more than one uh, lagging behind. But let's move on to our next question while people are still answering that uh, poll. Um, the New York State uh, Department Financial Services Division has suggested that payment of a cyber ransom may compromise sanctions. So cyber big sanctions. Uh, is that something that you've come across? I mean, this being New York, Bruce, can we come to you first? Sure. And, 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 and I'm actually going to step back for a second with respect to one of the check, check uh, questions about insurance. Uh, and this ties in with, with uh, what I'm going to say about New York and uh, DFS and also U.S. national policy on the payment of ransoms. You know, the fact is there are uh, exclusions in traditional maritime policies. Um, and uh, we've had, you know, uh, over the last few years, of course, you know, we have P&I, we have hulling machinery and, uh, you know, various additional perils, policies and so forth in the traditional maritime space. Um, but the new policy that shipping companies are perhaps beginning to embrace is the breach response coverage, which provides things like coverage for cyber extortion, data recovery costs, business interruption, very important. Uh, computer experts, crisis management, and PR, uh, and reimbursement, and it's a bit like P&I, they call it reimbursement only as opposed to pay to be paid, but it is a reimbursement payment for the payment, uh, policy for the payment of ransom. Um, and the premiums are going up quickly as are the deductibles because there are incidents every day. Um, but, uh, you know, our, our uh, traditional maritime uh, marine insurance policies enough to cover a uh, cyber security uh, breach. Uh, what happens if you have the ship steaming in circles, as Julian mentioned? What happens if there's an explosion or uh, other navigational incident? Are there, you know, the many, many different uh, policies are going to be implicated, marine and non-marine. Um, but going back to DFS, there's a concern among policymakers in the United States, including New York, that the payment of ransom to cyber uh, threat actors um, leads to more cyber crime. Um, this is without a question true. Um, and as ransoms are paid, the level of ransom goes up. Um, so it has long been the policy of the United States to discourage the payment of ransom. The policy of the state of New York, where the Department of Financial Services in February issued a public advisory on the issue, um, is considering perhaps making even the payment of ransom um, illegal. Um, and maybe we can go to, to the slide that says uh, cyber attacks and ransom payments, the seventh slide in the deck. <clears throat> Thank you, Bruce. And um, so uh, one thing that's interesting is that uh, you know we're, we're talking about ransom, but we're talking about ransomware. And as you can see uh, towards the bottom of the slide where it says cryptocurrency, it says ransom payments are almost exclusively made via crypto cryptocurrencies. I think you can safely say that almost all ransom payments these days in ransomware attacks are made in crypto. So there's no more payment of US dollars. There's no wire transfers. You don't know who you're paying. Um, the requests for ransom become extremely sophisticated. Um, and if you do have insurance, you can um, you know, get paid back. Uh, the insured will be reimbursed. The payment is usually made by a facilitator 
are a response consultant, and this is the cottage industry that's springing up all over the world that makes the payment in Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency, and they don't know who they're paying. This leads to risk. So if we could go to the next slide. <clears throat> and <clears throat> there is risk whenever you pay a ransom. And um, those risks um, for U.S. persons, for instance, involve sanctions risk. Uh, U.S. persons cannot pay uh, or cannot do business at all with anybody that's on what's called the SDN list, the Special Aided Specially designated national and block which is maintained by the Office of Foreign Asset Control or OFAC. So this is sanctions risk. There are a lot of uh, um, uh, threat actors out there who are SDN. There are also threat actors out there that are operating in sanctioned jurisdictions. A big one, the Lazarus Group, are operating out of North Korea. So there is enormous risk in making these payments that that the payor and perhaps that's the facilitator, or maybe it's the insured if there's a breach of responsibility policy, or perhaps even the insurer who has, you know, who's going to reimburse the person who's made the illegal transfer to an SDN, uh, and there could be um, sanctions risk. In addition, there could be risk under our secondary sanctions regimes to foreign companies who materially assist in the violation of sanctions. So, um, governments nationwide are looking at cybercrime um, and have publicly advised um, against the payment of rents. Um, the uh, former head of the uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency of the Department of Homeland Security has suggested a national conversation on the legality of the payment of rents. So this kind of thing is coming up and, in my view, will simply harm the victim but the risk forever. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Adi, what, what, how, what would your comments on that be? Well, I, I would take off from where Bruce stopped. Um, the OFAC aspect is related to Nigeria, and more particularly from the dollar aspect. Um, dollar payments still go through New York, and the SDN list um, will affect anybody that's making such payments. But like Bruce rightly pointed out, um, most ransomware or ransom payments nowadays are not made to bank transfers or drop-offs like we used to do for normal piracy related matters everything is cryptocurrency but interestingly um about i think about a few weeks ago the central bank of nigeria governor issued um, a new policy to all the financial banks to banks and other financial institutions under its control and purview to reiterate the ban on cryptocurrency so in effect Nigeria, before that ban, I think Nigeria was about the second largest Bitcoin market in the world, with about $500 million worth of Bitcoin traded over the last five years. And that just shut the market, which there were already um, bans and uh, circulars to that effect that banks shouldn't do it. But now they actually have now went ahead and told banks to close the bank accounts of people that use um, their accounts to trade Bitcoin. So in one sense, you can say that the government policy, and this is quite an interesting statement because even the vice president who happens to be a lawyer and a professor of law made commentary to the fact that we shouldn't be having an outright ban on cryptocurrency but to embrace the opportunities there because one of the excuses the recipient raised was the illegality and the dark side of cryptocurrency trading and um, its use for illegal activities like for ransomware and so so on one hand there's no clear policy as to banning or illegality on ransom payments in nigeria um but the regulator that deals with the financial sector has said that cryptocurrency is illegal uh, it's unregulated so it makes it difficult but uh, my colleagues in that space believe that it just increased the price and the uh, market for it but looking at it more closely i'm sorry to come back to this terrorism aspect i think terrorism has the multi-hydra element um the nigerian terrorism act makes it illegal for you to make payments to someone you know is going to use the proceeds for terrorism so that details into the fact that when you're making ransom payments, um, the tests, unlike losing the UK aspect, you want to test it on a case-by-case -case basis to determine exactly. So while the Nigerian Terrorism Prevention Act 2020, 2011, as amended, makes it unlawful for any person to knowingly do, attempt, or threaten to do an act perpetrated in furtherance of a terrorism act, commit anything that he reasonably believes to promote terrorism, 
you need to also look at this aspect. As I said, in the UK, the Terrorism Act 2020 requires actual knowledge for the victim to have reasonable cause to suspect that it will or may be used for the purpose of terrorism. Therefore, whilst companies are susceptible to cyber security risks, they need to consider whenever they do have an incident to actually get experts to help them look at these things to determine whether the payment will be deemed to be in breach of the terrorism provisions or not. And depending on whether they are also caught by the UK provisions, like UK Bribery Act and UK Terrorism Act, by virtue of their operations, they need to be careful about this. And then the issue of cyber security and business interruption insurance cannot be overstated. Um, going back on the closely related aspect, I know an incident uh, last year, which was one of the first um, cases whereby there was a conviction under the Nigerian Piracy Act. Um, two of the expatriates that were involved in that incident were responsible for just doing a pickup of um, um, crew that had been kidnapped. Ransom had been paid. There were security experts. Um, Justin had done a lot of transactions with them on KKR, but in this particular instance, they weren't doing any KKR drop-off. It was just to pick up the crew after the negotiation had been done, and they were charged. They were charged under Section 15 of the Nigerian Piracy Act, um, essentially because um, they said they had knowledge or they refused to give information which would aid the conviction of the terrorist. So you can see the level, while the state on its own does not have any, it's not legal to make ransom payments in Nigeria, but you need to be careful on the case-by-case -case approach as to how you're doing it. They were quite unfortunate. They were just picking up the people. But then if the government was willing to go that far, although they were convicted, they paid the, part of the fine and they, and they were let go. But it just tells you the coloration that may apply on the case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Thanks, Benny. I must... I must. Sorry, just a bit of an echo there. I think I think we're under the risk of kitty attack at the moment, rather than Bobby. <laughs> um, I'm very jealous. I'm very jealous that uh, Bruce has got a cat. I'm the one that should have the white cat. But uh, um, it's very interesting what you've raised, Daddy, in relation to piracy. I want to come on to that question. Um, I, I also want to share your concern. I don't, I don't know whether we hesitate saying this as lawyers. Um, because we don't want to be accused of Project Fear. But one of the things that gives me sleepless nights is maritime terrorism in the cyber sector. Um, and I am very concerned about the exposure that our sector has to international terrorism uh, through opened up through cyber attacks. So I, I think you are right to raise that, Addy. Um, before we go on to our next question, just have a look how, how the, uh, the polls are going. Um, and please do now access the second poll if you haven't done already. So our second poll is a question about how ready are you or your organization ready to meet an operational technology attack and uh, an IT attack. Um, interesting st uh, figures in relation to that Project Fear question. You know, are people actually seeing attacks? Well, we've got something like a uh, over a 50% uh, response that people have experienced one or more attacks and then interestingly on if you look at the feedback coming in so far on the difference between OT and IT uh, it's clear from those votes that are coming in so far that we are less prepared for OT than we are for IT which is of course supporting what all the three of us have been saying in our findings um, but I want to pick up on that point that, Adi, you, uh, you started to bring us into, which is this analogy between piracy and a cyber incident. Um, I'd be interested, both Adi and Bruce, in what you think about how there are further comparis comparisons in relation to piracy uh, and cyber in relation to legal and insurance issues. Um, the fact of how we deal with a, a piracy matter or we deal with a cyber matter uh, as lawyers also uh, looking at the way that pirates mind might now turn to cyber piracy so uh, data breach um, and indeed running back into that maritime terrorism risk i mean bruce can i come back to you uh, first of all on that sure thanks very much it was a very interesting out of your uh, presentation on uh, on this issue which uh, and I apologize for the cyber intrusion of my cat. But that's, <laughs> um, uh, uh, 
on, on issues involving piracy and, you know, okay, uh, cybercrime may be a new thing for the shipping business, but piracy has been here forever. And, and certainly the most recent experience um, in the U.S. for piracy involved the East Coast and Somalia, um, where there was actually a U.S. angle to it, and many of the issues were the same. There are many parallels. Um, <clears throat> piracy, you know, if you go to the, you know, late uh, years, 2007, 2008, uh, first decade of the century, um, where we began to see numerous uh, attacks on vessels by Somali pirates, um, which, you know, didn't really get much attention in the mainstream press um, and uh, uh, was really, you know, was covered in trade winds and voids list and uh, other shipping publications, but not something you saw on the evening news. And then um, in the United States, the big news was the Maris Alabama. And this is where it ties in with what Addy was saying. Um, this was front, front page news. We eventually had the movie with Tom Hanks. You had the navies and Navy SEALs and truck shooters and all this sort of stuff. But for the most part, Somali piracy was based on the age old crime of kidnap for ransom. Not too different than kidnapping your data, but these are real people and there were threats of violence, so a little bit different along those lines. Um, but at the time of the Marist Alabama, when it was the front page news every day for whatever it was, a month, um, Secretary of State, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said, we know how to separate terrorists from their money, and maybe we should be doing the same thing for pirates, which raised the concern that um, all of a sudden it would be illegal to pay ransom. For instance, if you are a U.S. citizen or you had U.S. insurers or U.S. reinsurers who were going to be sourcing the ransom money. A ransom wasn't delivered in crypto then. Crypto then it was put in a rubber tube and dropped from an airplane into the ocean. But um, but some of these methodologies are the same. So there was a big debate about legality of ransom payment. I tried to weigh into that at the time, saying, you know, unless you've got the might of the U.S. Navy behind you, and there was the naval presence of Somalia, but it was ineffective. Um, the only way these foreign flag vessels uh, were able to free their crews and save their lives was to be ransom. And if you made payment of ransom illegal, you would harm the victims so, um, ultimately, in April of 2010, the Obama White House issued an executive. Appended to that executive order was a uh, like a mini SDN list with 13 entities, uh, including terrorist entities like Al Shabaab and two known pirates. And so, the, uh, the executive order, in essence, said that no person, U.S. person or person or entity with the U.S. nexus, can pay anybody on that list. And so it really didn't make payment of ransom illegal, but it, it made it kind of look a little bit illegal. Now, a bit like we now have breach response, at that point, the shipping industry was deciding whether to do when it made a pass through the Gulf uh, Bay, whether it purchased kidnapping ransom or KR insurance, which responded to these events very much like breach response insurance and uh, response to cyber Ultimately, what ended up happening was a bureaucratic process where if when it was imminent that uh, a, a ransom payment was going to be made, an agreement was being reached with the Somali pirates, um, uh, usually a London law firm would reach out to me and said, you know, we've done a certain amount of due diligence. Uh, we spoke to these four pirates in negotiating the ransom. We've reported that to the serious fraud office in England. Uh, and we have no reason to believe that we're paying any of the people on that list. And um, so then we would go to OFAC, the same people who administer the sanctions regimes. They would do an interagency review and issue, quote, guidance. It didn't say go ahead and pay, but it was enough of a blessing for the insurers, reinsurers, and the banks who sourced the cash to get comfortable enough with the payment of rents. So it's the same regulatory regime that we're seeing now, and we have the same risk that the fear that the payment of ransom leads to more crime or can be payment to terrorists, um, you know, perhaps we should make the payment of ransom illegal or at least make it look illegal or make it look like the U.S. government is doing something to discourage it. So, 
Thanks, Bruce. I'm, I'm just interrupting you because um, I, I want to get Addy to come back, but also wanted to just look at some of the comments we're getting in on the chat. There's a lot of activity on the chat now. Um, Hagop uh, Babo Gian saying, again, sharing that issue about terrorism, uh, saying, what if for ge geopolitical reasons a ship was hijacked 9-11 style and driven into a harbour or destroyed at sea? I raised this point but was laughed at. Um I'd, well, hang up, I'm with you on that. I, I think it's a significant risk. We've got to start taking it seriously. Um, uh, Chris Sars making the point that the flooded water treatment was a, a poor cyber hygiene issue uh, rather than a pure OT issue. Uh, Chris, I agree with you. Uh, but the same commentator that I, I quoted from earlier said this, <clears throat> as OT cyber security attacks increase, Companies need to be more proactive about implementing stronger cybersecurity uh, controls and selecting the right tools to help them. While many security products have an IT focus, critical infrastructure teams need a tool that is purpose-built for ICS environments. Uh, this must be met so to adequately provide protection against cybersecurity threats. Uh, now, Chris Sars has also pointed out uh, that any organization which does not engage in at least basic level information security approaches uh, will be the tail blade of the grass. And Sean Reardon pointing out that on OT, uh, at the very least, people should be following the standards of IEC 62443. Um, and then just looking for a comeback to uh, Addy, looking at Anthony Hayes, uh, says, I think it's reasonable to say that a number of the existing attacks against ships, such as terrorism or piracy incidents, mm -hmm. such as improper loading, ballast, engines issues, etc., could well be enabled by cyber. I totally agree with you. Um, it, before Adi asks you to respond, here's a quick question, uh, which is, what's the take on risk medication as to cyber insurance in the global maritime industry? Uh, Adi, can you shed some more light on the Nigerian space? Uh, likewise, uh, Bruce, from the US perspective. Addy, can I ask you to look at that question and also uh, comment on that that uh, uh, piracy cyber interrelation question? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think uh, I do agree with Anthony that um, a lot of incidences we see nowadays could be cyber related. Um, cyber, as we discussed earlier on the OT aspect, and the implication for it to be affected by cyber risk is so huge. From a Nigerian perspective, I'll give you a bit of a, I'll paint a bit of a picture. Um, we moved a couple of years ago from single hall to double hall. Um, so that means we still have a lot of older vessels within our waters. The newer vessels we have are more in the offshore industry, which are used for DP1 to DP2 vessels that are related of that nature. So they come with high tech which is highly integrated with OT and IT. So you can imagine the older vessels that are still playing, trying to play catch up. The market is very poor, the ship owners are not getting enough work, and we're not asking them to upgrade. Um, so we clearly have vessels that can easily be hacked. Uh, in preparing for this webinar, I spoke to a couple of people in the IT industry, and they gave me examples of even government establishments that are responsible for handling financial information, as well as dealing with tax, how easily they hack them to be able to determine what their tests, the level of testers. So bringing it down as well, I spoke to a couple of underwriters and I could only find about two or three Nigerian insurance companies that offer cybersecurity insurance. So it tells you that it's still a new product and they are still being, the hands are still being held by colleagues in London market or outside to educate them on what is possible and from the maritime aspect, I know, thank God for the IGP, uh, who spread across the world, the International Group of PNI Clubs offer some level of guidance to their members, where we have a lot of Nigerian tanker owners, offshore support owners, be it ship owners, be it the American club, or West of England. But speaking to also to a couple of owners who are members of this club, Nigerian uh, managers and everything, they said, oh, we just take it. We don't even know what the requirements are. We don't know, I said, what policies are you putting in place? So. It's a bit of a word out to the IGP as well. They are the easiest means of getting compliance outside Europe and America, where they do have a lot of members, either on Chatra's liability or owner's liability, to educate them and also work in hand in hand with the regulatory authorities in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. Because um, Nigeria is going to start its own implementation. I don't know what the Marine Notice will say. I hope they will take guidance from the IMO um, guidelines. But that's still the minimum. 
Um, PNI clubs can also give a bit of an assessment as to what they've seen in other jurisdictions as to the minimum level that they are, uh, uh, they are having their owners comply with. And from the insurance aspect, then coming back to this back all to the old um, doctrine of Bremen Fide, the question then is, if I have an attack, am I going to tell my insurer every time? And how does that affect my policy? Are they going to audit me as well? So, and then the question is, just as insurers are currently just putting it as an extra policy for the ones that are being prudent, they're doing audits. What level of audits are you going to do? Are you going to rely on the state control who doesn't really understand what to do? So we need to provide, it's like a balancing act on both sides. I have no answer. I just thought throw all those things out there. Thank you. Adi, Adi uh, some brilliant points there. I mean, you, you identify something that uh, Sean Reardon has just picked up on, on the chat, which is something that so I've been describing as the Titanic scenario. In the, and the reason I say that is that what we are seeing is the tip of the iceberg in relation to uh, the attacks that are getting through and the attacks that are being spoken about. And Sean's point, which dovetails what you were saying with Adi, Adi was uh, the reluctance of operators to share threat intelligence uh, to the industry so that we're aware of what it is that's lying underneath the waterline, uh, I think is a significant point. Uh, I'd also share with you, Adi, that I was with an ethical hacker um, with a uh, an owner that was very confident that their uh, cape-sized vessel could not be cyber-hacked. Um, and uh, the ethical hacker went on board and decided to start his clock is what watch stopwatch on his watch running uh, from the moment of putting the first boot on the deck 23 minutes later he had control of the engine room the ballast systems navigation uh rudder pr propulsion uh 15 minutes with well, 27 minutes within 15 minutes after that he'd broken into the head office office head of his office had got all their financial data records all their data records of all their personnel and confidential board meeting minutes so it, it is it is real um gentlemen we've got about nine minutes left and there's a very good question here from uh, thomas quito uh, thomas i hope i'm pronouncing your surname correctly It'd be interesting to get a, an english law a nigerian law and a, and a u.s law perspective on this thomas asks this if a ship is hit by a cyber attack via a vulnerability and an onboard system to what extent might any resulting liability realistically be claimed by the owner from the supplier of such system software? Now, uh, Thomas, you've raised a great issue uh, if we could get into does that make a ship unseaworthy, but that's a whole other webinar. Um, if I could ask everybody to respond to that uh, pretty quickly because of the time. As a matter of English law, it would be a standard uh, contract uh, situation uh, as a first port of call. I would be concerned about uh, where my target software supplier was. I'd be concerned about whether there were restrictions in relation to limitation of liability within that contract and then establishing breach. From a tortious point of view, it looks like from your question, we would have damage associated to the, the loss, but whether we could in that circumstance establish a duty of care in relation to such an issue raises raises questions so theoretically for me as a matter of english law there would be a, a right of recourse but not one without uh, issues uh adi do you want to go from nigerian law as you know nigerian law is built on english law common law so a lot of things you said it's still contractual based um supplier and the owner probably has a contract that they entered into the terms of the contract will determine what is possible um and so that's where I'll leave it. I'll echo everything you said. But capturing on one of the other comments I saw in the chat box, which had to do with knock-for-knock -knock liability, which was quite mm -hmm. interesting, uh, I think um, that also answers the issue of liability. If that has similar provisions in the contract, then the answer we're looking about, then it's mute. There's nothing against supply at that point in time. So you need to look at the contract and see what it provides for. I'd like to hear what Bruce has to say. Thank you. Uh, and Bruce, is there a product liability issue here as well? Possibly, uh, I mean, most of these products are going to be reasonably bespoke, uh, not something just put into the stream of commerce by a manufacturer. Um, so I'm not sure you get into, you know, maritime products liability. I think it probably would be a contract claim, uh, perhaps a breach of warranties cl a warranty claim. There would probably be limitations on that, like you get your money back. Uh, it depends on what goods or services were purchased. 
Um, I expect that the providers of the software are very concerned about this issue, um, and there will be hotly uh, negotiated, particularly for a large contract, uh, terms as to what that liability might look like. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, six minutes left. I just want to, this isn't a question, but I'm going to throw this question out. We, we, I know we could all spend a lot of time answering this, so almost a very brief yes or no answer. If a ship is involved in a collision or a grounding, and the reason for that is a defect in its uh, systems, it's either its IT or its operational systems due to a cyber defect, whether or not that cyber defect is a defect in the system itself or is a hack, is that ship unseaworthy? Bruce. That was due diligence exercise before the vessel went to sea uh, to determine, you know, I guess, and I guess the answer is going to differ under your time haul policy uh, as it would for injured, uh, be different for injured seafarers uh, or others, or, you know, I can see yes, <clears throat> but I'd fight it. Uh, yeah. Adi? No, I didn't get your question. Was it a collision? So there's a, there's, a, there's a grounding or a collision, and the, the cause of that, or what's led to it, is a defect in the cyber systems on the vessel. And at this moment, you don't know whether that defect is due to a, a default in the system or whether it was the result of a hack. Vessel unseaworthy or seaworthy? Well, depending on who I'm acting for, I'll probably. <laughs> Uh, um, like I said, it depends on what the state of the due diligence the liability to see if I can first of all fall in that category before you start going down the road of seaworthy or unseaworthy. It would be a difficult one based on facts as well. You need to have um, support from the experts Thank to you. determine where it is. It's a difficult, it's an interesting question. I'll think about it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I mean, um, I, I think we've just justified our existence, uh, Addy and Bruce, for a few more years. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm with. I'm with Bruce, so it's that answer is, we'll find a way. I remember asking a Queen's Council in London if, in relation to a cyber attack, he could raise a recklessness. He, he thought there was a chance of using recklessness to break limitation of liability. And, of course, you're looking at you know, quasi-criminal standard under English law. Um, it's got to be intent or it's got to be willful negligence. Uh, and his view was, yeah, I'll have a go at that. If there hasn't been proper sufficient due diligence on the cyber systems, but but you know what? As we all know, to check the integrity of my hatch covers, I I can do that. There are people out there that can do that. I've got to check the integrity of each every cyber system that I've got on board my ship. Where do I start? Well, it depends um, on where you know, fall. If you fall under the project yeah. fear, and I can prove that, then it supports what you're saying that you didn't take it serious. Um, yeah, you have this note from the IMOs in 2017, as a prudent ship owner, what did you do since then? So, you can always establish that. Brilliant. Two, two, two minutes left and a great question just coming from Marco. What will, what will the change in maritime cyber security li liability be related to mass autonomous vessels? Wow. <laughs> That's an interesting one. The risk great. is heightened. It, the risk is just massively heightened. Because everything is cyber. Yeah, but I think yeah. um, we have had the benefit of um, since the resolution came out in 2017, and the mass developments are just picking up. They've taken that into consideration, and I want to believe that um, what they call it classification and approvals also take into consideration what remote is it a remote controlled or what's the control aspect for your data lines or things of that nature. So I'm not really bothered. I think um, it's something that must have been top of their mind all the whilst autonomous vessels. Thanks, Addy. Addy, Bruce, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to invite James back in to close down. I think we've got about a minute left. I'd like to thank you for your participation. I can say to ICLG, James, this was your brainchild. Uh, and I would say it's been a massive success because just looking at the chat here, People are really engaging and talking and thought-provoking issues between them. So you have created a real debate. So, James, thank you very much, and I'll hand over to you to shut down.
No, thank you, Julian, to uh, yourself, Addy, and Bruce, of course, for making it such an engaging um, conversation, and in particular to you, Julian, as well, for moderating it and uh, managing the technology. Um, discussing with Addy and Bruce while looking at comments, looking at polls, uh, it's certainly been so engaging from your point of view. And thank you as well to everybody uh, listening in, whether you've commented, whether you've sat back and just listen to, to everything. Um, I would agree, Julian, it's been engaging. We could have gone on for much longer. Um, and actually, I would like to invite you to continue this discussion. Part of this platform allows us to do a bit of online speed networking uh, after this webinar. Uh, you may notice on the left-hand side of your screen a networking tab. Uh, once this stage closes down, uh, the networking tab will become live and open for everybody to uh, do one-on-one -on -one chats um, for a few minutes before being booted off uh, onto the next person. So feel free to engage in that and continue that discussion. Um, and really, again, my thanks to the panel. I'm sure in 12 months' time, we'll still be speaking about the same stuff, but it may be even more complex uh, that we can be sure of. So thank you again to everyone. Um, I look forward to catching up with you soon. Uh, and uh, hopefully in the networking booths. Take care. Thank you, James. Thanks all. Thanks all. Thank you.